Hello and welcome to Edinburgh, where tonight the three candidates battling to be the SNP's next leader and Scotland's first minister will set out their case. I'm Beth Rigby, this is Sky News and this is Scotland's leadership debate. We're here on the banks of the River Forth in a building that has stood since 1707, the same year as the Act of the Union between Scotland and England. This evening, we have three candidates who want to sever that union and restore Scotland's independence. The vote to choose Scotland's next leader opened at midday today. The candidates have been campaigning and debating for weeks. Now it's decision time for SNP members, but it's not just about them, it's about all of us. The winner will lead a government in Edinburgh that faces a cost of living crisis and an NHS under strain. And what happens here could change the future, not just of Scotland, but the entire UK. So let's hear from them. Ash Regan, Kate Forbes and Humza Yousaf. Tell us why you have got what it takes to be Scotland's next leader. I'll start with you, Ash. I am the candidate for getting independence done. I am the only candidate with a published plan on legally achieving independence. And I am the only candidate with a published plan for what to do if Westminster says no. And I am the only candidate with a plan to improve the SNP. And I'm the only candidate who has already reached out and is uniting the wider yes movement. If you want independence, I am your only hope. Kate Forbes. Thanks, Beth. Well, tonight I want to offer a fresh vision to Scotland because continuity won't cut it. If elected First Minister, I want to reach across the divide and persuade no voters to vote yes in a future referendum. I want to put economic growth front and centre, not just as part of how we govern now to tackle the cost of living crisis and to reinvest in our public services, but also to make the economic case for independence. And poll after poll shows that I'm the most trusted to govern Scotland well and to govern for all of Scotland. How's you, sir? Good evening. I'm Hamza Yusuf, and I'm asking our SNP members to make me their first choice for First Minister. I want to build on that winning formula that has seen us win election after election. That radical, that progressive agenda, which has seen success for the SNP grow to unprecedented heights. I will build a team that will deliver independence so the voice of the Scottish people can no longer be denied. I won't just look to build an economic growth, I'll put the well-being economy at the centre of my plan so that the economy works for us, the people, not the other way around. I'm the only candidate who will stand up to Westminster's power grabs and maintain that pro-independence majority okay. in Holyrood. So I'm asking you to make me, Hamza, your first choice for First Minister. Thank you to the three of you. Now, those are the last speeches we'll hear tonight. Now it's time for some answers. And one of the big battlegrounds in this leadership contest is over independence. An exclusive poll conducted by YouGov for Sky News has found that when you exclude people who don't know or would not vote, 46% of people think Scotland should be an independent country. 54% said they would vote no. So let's start with a question that was actually sent to us by a viewer. I like this one. It's Bruce Lucas. And his question is, in the list of priorities, where does the question of independence sit? And I'll kick off with you, please, Ash. Well, for me, independence is a key question because um, Scotland is actually, as part of the UK, is suffering, I would say, disproportionately as a result of being part of the UK. If you think about Brexit, you know, Scotland was dragged out of the EU against our will. And the hard Brexit that we've got as part of the UK is having a disproportionately harsh impact on Scotland. We also have a cost of living crisis, again, driven by Westminster, and high energy costs. People in Scotland are struggling right now. And for me, one of the reasons to become independent is because that is the way we'll be able to solve some of these problems for people. At the moment, under devolution, okay. it always feels like Sorry. we're fighting things with one hand tied behind our back. Priority for you, Kate Forbes? Well, quite clearly, the people's priorities right now are cost of living and our public services, reinvesting in the NHS, for example. But for me, independence has always been about a means to an end. 
So in a country which is rich in energy, why are people struggling to pay their bills? It doesn't add up. And the reason is that power is so far removed from the people. So independence is a means to an end. But yes, the next First Minister is going to have to govern well. They're going to have to be trusted to deliver on the NHS, eradicating poverty and tackling the cost of living crisis. And those would be my okay. priorities. Look, independence is the golden threat that runs throughout everything we do. We have a Tory cost of living crisis. With independence, we don't just have to replace one Tory government with a pale imitation of a Tory government. We can get rid of Tory governments forever because they're not, they, they have never won an election in the last 50, almost 60 years here in Scotland. So yes, we will invest in our public services, but we can't do that while okay. the Tories continue their austerity agenda. So independence okay, is just, crucial just, just, to help us invest in those public services. Just we could, one answer, one, one answer, not, top priority, yes or no? It's the priority for Scotland because it's how we're going to deal with the so challenges yes. that Scotland faces. So, yes. But as First Minister, I will make sure it's my priority to work on the issues that are important okay. to the people of Scotland. Okay. So that's things like the NHS, okay. the cost okay. of living crisis so and it's the economy. So it's not your top priority? Good governance is my top priority, okay. including Thank delivering you. independence. Yes, independence is my top priority because it helps us to resolve the challenges we're facing with our public sector. That, that's interesting because of all three candidates, you have been the person, if you like, who has said repeatedly that it's going to take a long time and that you have to build sustained support and actually... I've not said, I've not you, said it'll take a long time. You've the person I've said independence that kind of kicked close. it down the, down the road, but now you're saying it's your top priority. Uh, that's, that's not correct at all. It's In fact, correct. I was asked this question on Sunday. I know it was a rival television channel, but I said that independence is coming, is inevitable. We're at that tipping point, in fact. But what we have to do to win independence is build that consistent majority mm. support. We're close but it's going to take a leader who can inspire people with that progressive vision and grow support for independence. Kate Forbes, do you think Scotland will be an independent country in three years' time? I would hope so, yes. You hope so. Ash, Reagan? With my plan, Scotland will be an independent country in three years' time. OK, so with your plan, it will be, Kate, you hope so. Hamza Yousaf? It can absolutely be independent in a few years' time, but it's going to require us to build that consistent majority support for independence. But it's interesting because our poll found that 52% of respondents don't think independence will happen in 10 years' time and only 30% would. What do you make of that, Kate? Well, You're we losing the argument. Back. We need to reset the discussion because we've been fixated over process rather than making the case for independence. This election is fascinating because whilst we're appealing to SNP voters and members, we really need to be on the front foot in persuading no voters to vote yes. That's what your polling shows. Your polling shows that we need to do more to persuade no voters to vote yes. So we need a leader that can reach out and certainly the polling illustrates that I can do that. The battleground is the economy. The battleground is uh, where we need to make a, an economic case. And it's not just about abstract political arguments, it's about illustrating and demonstrating how Scotland truly can be wealthier, fairer and greener, because if other countries the same size as Scotland without our natural resources can be wealthier, then why can't okay. Scotland? OK. Ash Regan, what do you make of that when people say a decade to go it's not going to happen? Well, I think it is going to happen. I think there is a demand from the Scottish people I think that the SNP hasn't been focusing on making the case for independence recently. And with me as leader, that would change. And I also think that the SNP government has lost its way a little bit on some key issues recently, which has led to the public having a perception that perhaps we're not focusing on the issues that are important to them. So under my leadership, I will, as First Minister, focus on the issues that are important to the people of Scotland. I will set the independence movement free, because rightly that should be out in civil society as part of the wider movement. And I will set up a commission to build the infrastructure okay. for independence. So that, that gets Scotland ready to become an independent country. Okay, okay well, look, that's independence. I'm sure we'll discuss it, discuss it more uh, as the evening goes along. But now we're going to do something a bit different because I'm going to ask each candidate some straight questions and I'm looking for straight answers. And then we're going to open it up to their leadership rivals. Now, before we came on air, we drew lots to decide who would go first. And the person who drew the short straw is Ash Regan. Ash Regan, if you just could come forward for me. Now, according to our poll, nearly three times as many Scots think you would be a bad first minister rather than a good one. And here's why. 17% think you are competent. 24% think you are incompetent. And there's a lot of don't knows. 13% think you're trustworthy versus 26% who think you are un 
trustworthy. So, Ash Regan, right now it seems that the public aren't sure, well, don't think you're up to the job. And the, the polling does show you that you are far behind your rivals. You've never served in Cabinet. Uh, so I start with a simple question for you, really. Can a rookie walk straight into the office of First Minister? <laughs> I'm far from a rookie. I've been in government for nearly five years. I think it's, it is fair to say, though, that in terms of name recognition, I'm definitely, before now, was definitely um, less well-known than the other two candidates. But I don't think, um, really, um, being a good First Minister has got anything to do with how well-known you are. Um, it's about whether people can trust you, whether you have confidence in your abilities to deliver, whether you can build a team, and whether you have a plan for doing things, uh, which I have, a plan for how we get independence. And it's also about competence, isn't it, and, and being able to execute plans. Now, You've walked... I, what I would like you to do is... You, you've talked about getting a, a Scottish currency within, quote, a couple of months of independence, quite ambitious plan. And it's really important because, obviously, it's the economy, it's people's savings, yeah. it's how everything works. So can you explain to me here, in as much detail as you'd like, about how you do that? Sure. So we have a Scottish currency group in Scotland which has senior bankers and senior economists on it, and there's many members of the SNP as part of that group. And in 2014, currency and whether or not Scotland could use the pound or whether they should have their own currency was a key battleground mm -hmm. um, as an issue in um, 2014 for the Yes campaign. And I felt that we didn't make the case adequately enough on that point. So my suggestion this time is that using the Commission, one of the tasks of the Commission will be to set up the infrastructure. And clearly, currency would be a key part of that. Um, my currency plans have been supported by a senior economist who wrote in The Times just last week saying, and he'd advised the World Bank and other countries on setting up central banks, saying that he backed my plan for currency. And I was slightly uh, misquoted in the time frame. What I said was we would do everything that we can do under devolution to get ready, but there were some things that we'll have to do during the negotiation period, because that could take some time. And so it's not going to take Once a couple of months. Once we become independent, we would transition within a couple of months. But no, setting up a central bank and a new currency usually takes somewhere between two and three years in total. What I'm saying is if we start the work now, by the time we become independent, we'd be able to transition so it's going to take over. A, sorry, it's and, going to take a couple of years. Well, it will, but if we start now, before we're independent, we build the infrastructure now, and then there's the negotiation period where we talk with um, the UK government to decide on how what the settlement is between Scotland and the UK. And then once we become independent, we move smoothly over to the new currency. Okay, and this is very so normal. Lots of other countries have done it. Lots of other new European countries have set up currencies and transitioned within a few months. So are you presumably going to set up this this whole process as soon as you become First Minister? I'm going to start work on that on the first day as First Minister, And what, yes. what institutions do you need, Ash Regan, to set up a new currency? So you need a central bank, and I'm going to start all the planning and preparation for that on the first day that mm -hmm. I get started. And that will be part of the commission. So I'm suggesting that we set up a commission which will plan out all this what infrastructure. What other institutions do you need to set up? Well, that's... Um, so the central bank and then the currency. Um, but, what but, else, but you need other institutions to set up a currency, so what are the other institutions? So I will take advice from the very best bankers and economists, and um, they will so be doing that for know. me. So the First Minister will not be involved in this process. This will be run by the Commission, and it will be filled with the best I, economists I, I know and that. bankers. But, but you, you want to set up an independence currency. All I'm asking is, what other institutions do you need to set up apart from the central bank? Well, that's the institutions you need. And the reason you need to do this is because if we carry on down this road, and if we say that we're going to use the pound, Scotland is very exposed. The economy is very exposed. We've seen that in recent times with the pandemic. So what we've seen is that countries that don't control their own currency had to go to the IMF for a bailout. Yeah. So I would say it's smart planning here. This is a credible plan to set up. I can't give you the full details on how it would work yet, because obviously we've got to go through that process. But what I'm saying is I'm committed to doing this. I think it's the right plan for Scotland. And also, what it shows confidence that Scotland could be independent because we're beginning, we're beginning to set up those institutions. It's just you made, you made um, independence and, and a new currency a key, a key plank of it the is. campaign. Now it you're saying that plank. it's going to take two years, not no, a I couple said, of No, I've months. always said that it would take that time. Okay. Right. Um, that is the transition time. And, and you've talked about a central... Ba what about the other institutions you need? What other institutions are you talking about? You don't know. The Independent Debt Management Office. Right, I'm sure. As I said, I don't have Fiscal the full dog. detail on this at the moment because um, this is going to be the stuff that will be looked into by the Commission and the senior economists and bankers. As a First Minister, you are surrounded by civil servants, you have top advisors that would be able to advise you on this. 
I said very publicly right at the beginning of this contest that um, being able to set out a detailed policy program in a week was a, an impossibility. So I am setting okay. out some key lines here, which are um, the direction that I would go in, but I, I'm quite upfront with you. I cannot fill in all the details at this point. Okay. Well, that's, thanks for clearing that up about the timing, but also um, you do need other institutions, as I'm sure your advisors will tell you. Another critical um, policy area has been education. Do you think that um, you can hit the uh, target to close the poverty-related attainment gap by 2026? I would like to think that we could. I know we have done some good work on that. And um, we're certainly getting uh, more children from deprived areas into universities. We've done some very good work with care experienced children, getting them into positive destinations. Okay. But I think there is more that we can do, yes. And I'm running out of time. So the thing that most people also remember from your campaign is your idea of an in independence thermometer to measure readiness. What is it? Where will you put it? And how big is it going to be? So that wasn't my idea. That was something that I'd heard other groups talking about it. But I think the kernel of it is right. So the idea is that the Commission will do the work, the preparation and the planning in order to get Scotland ready. But we need to and we must communicate that progress, that readiness to the public. So we just need to have some way of communicating that to the public. Perhaps it's um, an index, perhaps it's just information on a website, I don't know, but it needs to be communicated okay. to the public but because that is what will build confidence with the public that Scotland has what it takes and it's ready to become okay. an independent country. But not country. necessarily a physical thermometer. No. Okay. All right, thank you, Ashwigan, if you'd like to go back. Uh, well, that was... Ash Regan, uh, Kate Forbes, what did you think of that? Well, I think the challenge here is that the key part when it comes to independence is ensuring that we've got a stable economy. And that's far more important than our own currency in the first few days of independence. Yeah, and the reason that's important is because with a prosperous economy, we can eradicate poverty, we can increase the tax base and ultimately get the revenues that we need for our public services. If you, so if my you can't, if you can't be... control your own monetary policy, you're taking an, uh, an absolute crazy risk with the Scottish economy. Anyone will tell you that. But what's the You don't have the ability to create liquidity. You can't manage your own economy. You've got no flexibility. It's very dangerous and risky. But anyone would tell you that it's a risky experiment on Scotland that you're proposing by well, using the argument. Strategy. The argument on, on the economy that will really persuade people is the fact that Scotland can afford to be fairer, for example. Everyone knows Scotland and can afford to be is, independent. That is critical, that Scotland can afford to be uh, fairer. And that's part of tackling poverty. And my question would be, what powers of independence would you use to tackle poverty and make the case for independence in that way rather than focusing purely on currency, yeah. although I currency is important? I don't think that we need to do that. I think what we need to do is we need to govern wisely because that creates trust with the public and we've, we've known that and that has worked very well for us in the past. But then what we need to do is we need to set out a credible plan for how we get there and how Scotland will be independent. And we need to answer these key questions where, that were battlegrounds before and where we didn't quite make the case. I think if we can do that, we will almost certainly win people over. We're roughly 50-50 most of the time. The polls do go up and down at times, but roughly we're almost there. And if you think about where we set off, um, you know, in 2012, you know, support for independence, I think when that was first muted, something like 27%. So to suggest that there's an uphill battle to climb here, I think do, it's not do you credible. Think, do you think that we have become obsessed with process to the detriment of making the economic case for independence? I do. I think we have definitely taken our eye off the ball in terms of making that case for independence. Um, answering some of these questions that people had. People were, can, had concerns about independence and we need to make a better case. We need to pay, make people feel safe, that they can, they can safely choose independence and know that their family will be looked after, that schools will be good, that the NHS will be well run and so on. But of course... Okay, Kate, okay, I'm going to have to stop you because it's Hamza's turn. Thanks. Uh, Ash, you accept that there's other countries, in fact, across the Irish Sea that have used the sterling and then transitioned to their own currency. So it's not to say that this isn't a tried yeah. and tested model. Hamza, you've said, the second, that, the you've said thing... that my plan isn't credible, but have you looked at who's backing my plan? Uh, to it's... say that it isn't credible means you haven't even given a cursory look to the plan, the planning that's been done by senior I, bankers and economists. I have the vast majority of economists say that you cannot set up your own currency in the space of a few months. In fact, I never you've said just, that. You I never have just contradicted yourself. Well, unless everybody else is hearing something else, Ash. They are managed hearing to contradict else. yourself. No, I have no never contradicted myself. myself. I've been very the clear other... right from the start that there would be a planning period, an infrastructure building period, and the two-month period that was quoted was just for transition. It was not building the whole currency in the okay, central bank. I'm, 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 I'm pleased three weeks into the campaign you've, you've managed to clarify. That's what the I said second, right at the beginning. I said the that The second thing ago. I wanted to ask you was, you seem to want to set up a lot of commissions and hear no, from a lot one. of people, a few commissions, just one. where you want a lot of advisors to, to tell you what oh, the ideas... Oh, we're suggesting that we well, go ahead without being advised by the best Well, if you let me finish people. and not, not interrupt me, because I didn't interrupt you when you spoke. 
if you, uh, if you want to set up a lot of commissions to hear from advisors, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But on the economy, which is the, one of the biggest issues that we're facing, the cost of living crisis, have you got a single plan for the economy if you're the first minister in two weeks' time? Because you haven't I been have. able to clarify, of course you haven't I been have. able to give detail of a single I've set all my plans plan. out. So well, I was the first person to talk plan. about infrastructure before what, what, what the other two candidates. What would you so do I was talking about roads building projects what roads would that have been mothballed. So what, infrastructure is very important. What roads I was would the you first build? candidate to talk about um, a, a plan for housing. Well, let's just, a, let's a just stop on the, on the road. And I was the first candidate to talk about an energy company. An idea that I see you've picked up through hearing me talk about it over the last few weeks. You hadn't set what that road, out before. What, I was the first person to set that out. So what road would you build and how much would it cost? So I've said, you know, we had promised the people of the north and the northeast of Scotland that we would duel the A9 and the A96. And we haven't completed on that so promise. So how much would that cost? We are, losing, the we are losing the trust of people in the north of Scotland. I, I, I we, hear what you're as saying. I'm just party, trying to get specifics, Ash, because... We make promises You make a lot things, of promises We have to deliver on them. Sure, you make so a lot of really promises... that's really important. I hear you. You make a lot of promises without specifics. So you would duel the A96. How much would it cost and when would you get it done by? So what I've, set, what I've committed to is that within my first 100 days, I will set out a new plan on how I'm going to deliver that and to what timetable. So you don't know. And how much it would cost? Well, it hasn't gone out to tender again yet, so nobody knows how much it would cost. There's no possible way to answer that question for anyone right now. Um, I think one of the issues that we've run into is the way that the contracts are being put out to tender. I think one issue might be if we can break them down into much smaller... Um, bundles, then we might be able to get smaller and more local contractors to come in and take over some of that work at a cost-effective level. OK, we're going to have to wrap that up now because it's Finance Minister Kate Forbes. If you could step to the podium. Now, Kate Forbes wants to be the candidate of change in this election, even suggesting that her government's own record is mediocre. Just over a quarter of people think you would be a good First Minister, but more than a third think you do the job badly. 37% think you're competent, 20% think you're incompetent, 30% think you're trustworthy versus 27% who think you are untrustworthy. It looks like, Kate Forbes, when it comes to the public, you're coming out on top, but you have alienated some of your own members, and I want to come on to some of those issues. But what I want to start off with with you is child poverty, because you're making this the cornerstone of your campaign. You've said it's disgraceful that one in four children live in poverty in Scotland. I know part of the solution, a big part, is to grow the economy, so I don't want to spend too yeah. much on that. I know that, that already. But will you also, as Hamza Youssef has done, pledge to increase the Scottish child payment to £30? I am open to uh, increasing the Scottish child payment. I think, actually, the biggest question, rather than giving an amount right now, is to understand the impact of the cost of living crisis at the time of the next budget. Because, quite clearly, inflation is at an all-time high right now. It's starting to decline. Bank of England forecasts that it will continue to decline. But we know that those deep social inequalities are only going to be exacerbated through it. And I'm certainly open to it as one means of uh, eradicating child poverty, certainly not the only mean. Child poverty is 24%. It's as high as when the SNP came into power 16 years ago. Indeed, and we've obviously been through 10 years plus of austerity. We've seen the, the welfare system being uh, destroyed by the UK government. Uh, we've seen the impact of COVID um, and the fact that poverty is not just about poverty of income or poverty of warmth. It's also about poverty of loneliness and of love. And it's about reaching out into these families and households to offer these young people hope. Just to, be, just to be concrete measures of talking about the mm. cost of living. I mean, you're saying now that you will look at the £30. You didn't say that a while ago. Uh, so now you, you've slightly moved on that. But the Child Poverty Action Group and 70 other charities and groups wrote to you and other candidates this afternoon to say it needs to go up to at least £40 a week by the end of the Parliament. Will you commit to that, well, And I Forbes? think I, I'm certainly open to it. What I'm not going to do is set budgets ahead of next year because I think those budgets need to reflect the challenges of the time. The Scottish Child po Payment is not the only way to support mm. these families. So, for example, fuel insecurity is massive and okay. ensuring that the fuel insecurity fund is also expanded. But ultimately, what we need is parents to be in secure 
well-paid employment okay. because you've got mums with two jobs who can't feed their kids. And Kate Forbes, let's move to social issues because it's dominated your campaign because many feel that you are out of touch and tune with modern Scotland. There will be unmarried couples with kids watching this, gay married couples watching this, thinking that you disapprove of their lifestyle. There's the camera. Will you apologise for the hurt you've caused well, in some I of your remarks? Well, I certainly, certainly don't disapprove whatsoever. What I have set out is that I will defend, as I have through successive budgets, the rights of everybody in Scotland to live and to love without harassment and fear. I mean, people like, you know, there are people in my own family um, and I, my job as an elected representative is to represent everybody without prejudice and to okay. deliver for all of Scotland. Right, OK, you'll say that you will protect existing rights. You say that you'll seek to enhance the rights of everybody. The Scottish Government's committed to introducing legislation by the end of the year on ending gay and trans conversion practices. If you're First Minister, will that legislation on banning all conversion therapy go ahead? I've already stated that I think conversion therapy is abhorrent, that coercion is abhorrent, and that I will continue to support um, banning uh, conversion therapy. I made a, you've made a distinction about coercion. Just to be clear, will you ban conversion therapy, whether by coercion or consent? Well, I have said that we've obviously not... It's a really simple indeed, question. But we've not legislated yet. So we've had the reports, and I think it's critical that I reflect okay. and listen to those reports okay. and take that flight. Right, well, I'll give, you the, I'll give you the report because the detail on this is really important. The expert advisory group on ending conversion practices, commissioned by the Scottish Government, said this, quote, We are clear that... As they constitute a human rights violation, it is not possible for individuals to genuinely consent to conversion practices being carried out against them. So I ask you again, will you ban all conversion therapy, be that coercion or consent? Well, and my commitment to you is to look carefully at that and to take the legislation forward. What I'm not going to do, because I don't think any government has done that yet, is to proceed the I, normal process of the legislation. Yeah, it's, I, I'm just asking for a clear answer here, Kay. I'm going to ask you again. My clear answer to you uh, is that I think conversion therapy is abhorrent. It doesn't have any place in Scotland. And the legislation must ensure so, that it is targeted and ensure that so it takes that to into be, account. To be fully clear, will you commit to ensuring there are no exemptions to a ban on consent or anything, that there is no exemptions to banning conversion therapy I, in I Scotland? I think con conversion therapy, full stop, is abhorrent. And so in terms of the legislation that would be introduced under my leadership, it would reflect the fact that conversion therapy okay. is abhorrent. Right, OK. So you're saying if someone by consent wants to have their sexuality changed, you think that they should be allowed to do that? Is that a legitimate thing? No, so I, you think, I think it shouldn't that be people allowed? people should be allowed to live freely as they choose. <coughs> And I do not think that there should be, uh, that there should be con conversion therapy uh, in existence in Scotland. So do you think then a gay man, adult man, if he wants therapy to change his sexuality, should that be allowed or not? Well, it's, 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 it's his choice, um, but I do not think we should allow conversion therapy. It's his therapy. choice? Well, he, we should not allow conversion therapy in Scotland. That's, so, that's so right, but you, you know, just said it's his choice. And this is all about whether and you're going to because, ban it or not. No, because, because my position on this is that people should be allowed to live as they choose in a free, tolerant society. And I think the conversion therapy bill should reflect that. But you're also asking me this in advance of the parliamentary legislative process proceeding. Okay. We've had the evidence. We need to reflect on the evidence and introduce a bill that reflects that evidence. OK. All right. Kate Falls, thank you. If you'd like to return to your spot. Uh, I'll start with you, Hamza Youssef. What, what questions do you have following that? Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, amongst the SNP supporters, when we started this race three weeks ago, you were ahead. I'm now 19 points ahead in terms of SNP supporters, uh, and you've gone back into a negative uh, rating. I accept that we have to reach out to no voters, but it's so, so important, isn't it, that we don't lose our own supporters and that we're able to reach out, and the way we do that is by not abandoning our progressive agenda, isn't that right? Well, I 
believe that we should serve all of Scotland. And I think it's probably my approach that means I continue to outperform both yourself uh, and Ash when it comes to enjoying the trust of supporters. the public. Enjoying the trust of the public and indeed the, the trust of SNP supporters. Another poll out today, we've just heard the findings demonstrate once again that it's my message of introducing change that is cutting through. And if we want to win independence, we both agree it's important to win elections, but it's even more important to win independence. And to do that, we have to persuade those who are as yet unpersuaded to our so cause. That, that's a very good point, but we also can't lose the support that we've got. And isn't the challenge, isn't the reason you're losing SNP support is because as that exchange with Beth has shown, you're not able to give a really straight answer to a really straight question on our progressive agenda, and that's going to lose our support. So you can, well, you can appeal to Conservatives I mean, because of maybe the economic vision that you've got, but you're not able to well, maintain the support that you've got. I'm appealing to Labour. That's what the polling indicates. You're losing support I'm from the SNP. I'm indicating Labour on the basis of progressivity being speaking up for the voiceless, ensuring that we eradicate poverty, increasing... Uh, wages and terms and conditions for our social So let me, let me ask That's a question a in a different way. package of appealing to voters who don't yet support let, us. Let me ask the question then in a different way. Why do you think that you now have a negative rating, according to Sky uh, News poll, why on do you, what? Why do you think you have a negative, negative rating, rating on, on uh, S because I'm SNP positive. supporters? Mine's because is 19 points ahead of you. You're because with, I am... all, with those uh, supporters of the SNP who would intend to vote for us in the next hold election, uh, you've got a, a negative rating, I've got a um, positive rating. Hamza, on, Do you know on, the reasons why? On the why? polling, I don't think that's where you're particularly strong. Amongst the SNP members, polling, I've, the momentum is definitely with me. I have not only got net positive ratings, I've actually got higher net positive ratings than either of the opposition leaders. I'm, I'm asking and you a very straight question. You've not an answered. election winner. I, I, you've not answered, it's a really straight question. Why do you think you've got a negative rating amongst SNP supporters. You had a well, positive one when this race can started. Can I ask why you didn't have any concerns? You can ask the question. You why ask, you didn't you have any ask concerns question, when I was introducing I'm, budgets? I would rather you answer the question as opposed to... You can I ask me a question in a minute. Only, I'm about to be only only questioned poll, by... The yeah. only poll that matters is, of course, the one that SNP voters are involved with today. And it's my impression that SNP voters want someone who can win elections. They want someone who can deliver that independence. Means not losing they support. want somebody who can govern well. And on all okay. the polling that we've had, okay. I am ahead when it comes to these key metrics. Not with SNP. I need to bring Ash in now. Ash Reagan, what what did you make of Kate's remarks? Well, I want to ask Kate about her plan for how we get to independence. So we've had uh, the same process that we've been going through for the last few years where we've been winning elections and we've been using that to beg Westminster to give us a referendum. And you've said you'll repeat that process. Why would you re want to repeat a failed strategy? I am not going to repeat a failed strategy. I think we need a fundamental reset. So I think right now the approach needs to be very intentional and very explicit in terms of attracting no voters to vote for independence. To do that, we need to be on the front foot. I do not think there's been enough work done on making the economic case for independence or having answers. And I also think that fundamentally, good governance is political. Govern well, earn trust, and you persuade people to vote for independence. These are the things that we need to do you and will, we need to get serious about. And I about. think that's right, and I think we both agree on that. However, this isn't Northern Ireland. So in Northern Ireland, obviously, they have a mechanism where if support rises to a certain amount, they're, in, they're entitled to have a border poll. We don't have that mechanism here. So just building support, which is obviously very straight, you know, that's an obvious route, doesn't actually translate that into any way to get a mechanism in order to get to independence. So what would you say to that? So the process, I think, almost not quite takes care of itself when you see that significant increase in support for independence. But it doesn't, it doesn't Well, it does, it because I don't think the dial on independence has shifted as substantially as I would have liked, or indeed you would have liked. Despite the fact that we've had Brexit, we've had the cost of living crisis, we've seen the UK government try and erode devolution, that dial hasn't shifted enough. And I think it's because we haven't laid the groundwork with the, the, the economic case. I think it's because we haven't listened to no voters, and indeed, dare I say it, Respect no, I would agree with that. We haven't I would agree with all of that, yet. but I'm still lacking an answer to the question of what is the plan. You know, independence has been as high as 56%, I think, in some polls. But I'll we admit, want it not higher, consistently. Don't we? But what will you do to translate that high support other than begging Westminster for a referendum? Well, certainly we won't be going cap in hand. But I think we want to ensure that there is as much support as possible, not just because that's a means to get independence, but also but it's can the you way see that why people Scotland would think that there is no plan here? There's, no, well, there's nothing different. No, there, this there, is the status quo. There is a plan. There is, is a the plan. status quo, isn't it? Not quite, because the plan right now, the plan to date, 
has not shifted the dial as substantially as it needs to. And you have obviously focused on process, which is quite right. But it doesn't matter what the process is if you don't increase the support for independence. I think we can do it, but we need to get serious about listening to no voters and understanding why they still so have not yet been So you think persuaded. Scotland... Ash, I'm going to have to wrap it one okay. more quickly. Well, I was going to ask you as well, do you think it's hypocritical to be coming out and saying that you'll give carers, uh, you know, the £15 an hour when you had the power to do it, of course not you didn't at all. do it? The reason why it's not hypocritical is because the only way to fund it is to realign budgets. Right now, we've got uh, hundreds of, of millions of pounds being spent on delayed discharge. If we okay. realign the budget, reduce delayed, delayed discharge, we can pay our carers more. Right. So it's about a realignment of budgets. OK, Kate Forbes, I'm going to have to wrap it there. Um, now, let's turn to you, Hamza Yousaf, the Health Secretary, has, has, who has said he's happy to be labelled the continuity candidate in this election. Now, according to our poll, twice as many people think you would be a bad First Minister as a good one. 22% of people think you are competent. 40% think you're incompetent. Only 18% think you're trustworthy versus 42% who think you are untrustworthy. That's pretty disappointing, isn't it? Well, look, I've had 10 and a half years of having the most difficult and toughest jobs uh, in government. But look at this campaign. When this campaign started three weeks ago, I've managed to quadruple my some support amongst the public. But when this campaign started, I was behind when it came to SNP supporters. I'm now 19 points ahead. I've done that in three weeks. Imagine what I'm able to do in three months. I'll be able to inspire people with the vision that I've got for a socially just Scotland and get more and more support, not just for the SNP, but for the cause of independence. Well, you seem to be taking those rather harsh poll, poll uh, decisions uh, on the chin. But look, let's, let's talk about... The, that's because the momentum's with me. Okay. Look at what's happened in three months. Okay, well... Increased support. Well, let's talk about your portfolio. NHS, it's a top vote priority. I want to look at your record as Health Minister. What's your target for the number of patients who should be seen in A&E within four hours? 95%, of course, was the pre-pandemic target. And, of course, our A&E departments in Scotland are the best performing anywhere in the UK. That's not down to coincidence or down to chance, of course. That's down to the leadership. So it's 95% the target. When did you last meet it? Uh, well before the pandemic. But Beth, July of course, 2020. Of course, the important point to mention... Well, of course, that was because we weren't doing any elective care. Yeah. That's because we had stopped and What's... paused uh, most of our NHS services. how are you services. doing now? How are you doing but, now in the A&E well, well, it's about 65% or 64.9%, I think, was the last figure that came out. But let me just make this point, Beth. Well, the context, 2022. The context, of course, is that we've had a global pandemic. The mm. biggest shock that has hit okay. the NHS, under my leadership, what have we had? The fastest COVID okay. booster rollout. We've had a &E waiting times, 8 and 12 hour waits, reduced by almost 50% okay. since the winter peak. And, of course, in Scotland, not a single member of the All NHS right, has take, gone on strike let's because take of my another, leadership. OK, talk about the pandemic. Let's take another area... Uh, of healthcare, cancer treatment. The Scottish Government set a target 13 years ago that 95% of patients will start treatment within 62 days. How's that going? Have you ever met that target? Uh, again, we haven't met the target because we're in the midst of a global pandemic or That's recovering the target since from 2010. that. The target since 2010. I'm asking if you ever met it. We're recovering from Have the you ever met the target since 2010? We haven't met the target, but we're of we course making progress before the pandemic. And the point is that every single effort is going in to make sure we recover our NHS from but the global the pandemic. Point and I'm that's making why. to you is under the SNP government, the target in cancer care has been missed apart from one year in 13 years. You can't blame that on the pandemic. What's, what's the. More, when, what it, when, it, when it comes to the 31 day target, of course, we have met that target. You're talking about the 62 day target, which of course is more challenging to suggest that there hasn't been progress and meeting those targets, I'm afraid, target. I'm is telling incorrect. You it's been missed. Ah, but but, but to right, suggest well, that there hasn't been progress being made, when we've well, met that 31-day okay, target... OK, okay so, 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 so if we accept that the pandemic has distorted targets and made them hard to meet, Distorted course, would be a bit of an of understatement. OK. And the biggest well, well, shock okay. that the NHS has faced in 70... All right, well, let's look at post-pandemic targets that you set in July, post-pandemic targets. You promised inpatients who'd been waiting more than two years that they should be seen by the end of September 2022. How many of them were still waiting 
by the end of September Actually, 2020. if you remember the target, if you've got it there in black and white, it's, of course, that we would eliminate waits for the longest waiters in most specialities. Most specialities. I'm pleased and outpatients, we managed to reduce most specialities to either 10 people or fewer. So How we met that target. How many people were waiting at the end of 2022? At the end of 2022, and September, or outpatients? It was 7,288. Ah, but again, the target was to eliminate in most specialities. I'm sorry, you can't just change the goalposts, Beth. The goalposts were, and the target was, to eliminate in most specialities. In most specialities, we had 10 or fewer people waiting when it came to outpatients. But overall, you had 7,288 people waiting. OK, let's take another final target that you set. Outpatients waiting for more than a year would be seen by the end of March 2023, so the end of this month. More there specialities. Most uh, 35,000 people. You've got two weeks to do that. Will that happen? You're going to hit that target? I'm hopeful that we'll be able to meet the target in relation to most specialities. But of course, we have to also accept that this winter, the winter that's just passed, has been the most difficult winter NHS services, not just in Scotland, but in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland have faced. And I've got no doubt that will have an impact. But I want to thank our NHS staff for the incredible work that they've done. And that's why I've made sure they've been paid fairly. And that's, of course, why we've avoided a single day of NHS, uh, a single day of strikes in our NHS here, uh, here in Scotland. But I put it to you that if you are a cancer patient, there were targets set in 2010, they haven't been met. In the pandemic, uh, the targets weren't met. And in terms of a &E, they're nowhere near being met. It's 65%, isn't it, in terms of the four-hour wait. And then in terms of the targets you've set, you're now saying, well, it's most specialities. So if you don't hit the target, then... That, that was the target, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was the target that I set originally in, in, in August, or sorry, it was uh, the beginning of summer uh, when I set those so, targets. So, so when, I, I, so when, when I lay... So when I lay all of that out, after all of that, you really think that you deserve a promotion to First Minister? Let's leave that to the SNP members, because what I've done as Health Secretary is roll out the fastest ever COVID booster programme. Okay, well, what I've done the, is ensure on, on, on that our, no NHS staff have had to go on strike. On and our, what I've done is reduce inpatient and outpatient waiting lists okay. for the longest waiters by 25%. All right, well, on our poll, the government's handling of the NHS, 30% of people said that you were handling it well. 62, that's only two in three Scots, said you were handling it badly. So that's what the public say. Again, if you look at three weeks ago when this campaign started, I've managed to quadruple my support amongst the Scottish public. Amongst SNP supporters, I was behind. I'm now 19 points ahead. That's in three weeks. If I'm able to inspire people, not just in three weeks, but in three months, I genuinely believe that we'll not only grow support for our party, but for our independence cause. OK, thank you. If you'd like to return back. Uh, Kate Forbes, you hinted you might not keep Mr Yousaf in his job the other day. Has he changed your mind? I think it might well, be more trust, than a hint. Right trust, now. trust matters, obviously, when it comes to winning elections. And we've just heard about the health service, but actually on every policy area, in every single survey of the public, I am more trusted to do a better job. Why do you think that is? Uh, I've noticed, actually, in all of the polls, you've managed to appeal to Conservative voters the most. And Labour uh, voters uh, and SNP members. I didn't interrupt you, Sophie. Let me finish. Uh, no, actually, in SNP members, you've managed to drop support quite significantly. Uh, amongst Conservative supporters... So I'm not surprised that amongst Conservative voters uh, and Conservatives, I'm not all that popular. I'm a progressive who wants to break up our union... who wants to break up the United Kingdom. But why do you think on policy areas... So we're talking about policy here. So good governance matters. So a good health service matters. Sure. Dealing with the economy matters. I mean, what would you do to deliver, for example, uh, economic growth in our economy? And why do you think I'm more trusted to tackle the cost of living crisis so suspect, than you are? So I suspect because you've not had a public service delivery role, where I've had three of the most difficult uh, in government over the last 10 and a half years, of course, they're challenging. There's no doubt about it. And Health Secretary, in the midst of a global pandemic, on your question on the economy, I think the difference between you and I is I want to promote a well-being economy that puts people at the centre. That's what I do. I want to make sure we have a Minister for Small Business and Innovation who works across government. I want to look at every single regulation that we pass for small businesses and see what more we can do to ease that burden you, uh, on small businesses. I've got a lot more to say, but... Do you, do you think a uh, future First Minister and leader of the SNP should appeal to more than just SNP members? And again, so, I go back to the point of if the public have seen how you perform, why do you think I am more trusted on every policy area across the public to deliver? I think in truth, I think in truth because you've not had a public service delivery role in government. I think that's why, uh, probably, uh, that's probably the reason why. But let me also say, I agree with you, we do have to appeal 
to no voters. That's a fair point. And only a fair, way to deliver independence. And it's a fair point. Well, it's not the only way, because what you have to do is you have to maintain your own support. And you started this race as the bookies' favourite, the runaway favourite. Well, not quite. And now amongst the SNP support, you've managed to plummet. Your support and your ratings have dropped. And yet... And it's so important but to, to retain that progressive agenda, to retain, build upon absolutely. the progressive agenda. But how are you going to deliver independence if the public don't have confidence in you? Uh, they do. In f three weeks, I've managed to increase public support, quadrupled it, in fact. Now, that's what I've managed to do in three so weeks have when people improved. have heard my... Uh, that's, what, that's, that's what the public have, 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 have put their improved. confidence in me in three weeks. Imagine you, what I could do in three if months. If you have improved, yet I still have the highest net positivity ratings. I'm still more trusted in every policy area. And when it comes to, I don't know, let's take, what would you do to incentivise jobs and uh, growth in three of Scotland's biggest industries? Well, there's a number of things. First of all, I would power our green sector and our green economy. I've made the point, of course, that I don't just want to lease our future offshore wind. I want to make sure we have a public equity stake in it. What I'll also do is I'll make sure that I reduce the burden in small businesses. I also want to invest in innovation. Scotland's got a great, a great reputation, a world-class reputation in life sciences. I want to invest... Yeah more money into life sciences. I okay. can go on. I can give you another five if you want. Okay, I'm going to bring Asher Regan on. Um, you keep shaking your head. Yes. What would you like to say to Hamza? I'd like to ask. So you've mentioned the Queen's Ferry Crossing. And obviously that's a very successful major infrastructure uh, project in Scotland. Can you explain why you're claiming credit for your involvement in that when you actually had no part in the design of it, um, nothing to do with the contract awards or the building? And in fact, what you were responsible for was a six-month delay. Uh, no, actually, it came in under budget. And, of course, I completed but the project. that wasn't anything to do with you. I accept. And you can sit here and feel free to attack the SNP's record on the Queen's Ferry Crossing. I don't think it's going to do us I'm not favors. attacking the SNP's you record. Are. You're you're suggest, you're asked, you are. You're suggesting that it wasn't you. as successful. No, I did not say that. Don't let's, put words in my mouth. Let's not let's not interrupt each other. You. I'm answering your question. Well, I'm, you're not answering the question I've asked you. I am. I've I oversaw the completion you. of the Queen's Ferry no. Crossing. And under budget, you a were tremendous came in infrastructure at the end, program. One year from the end of a 10-year project. So I'm asking you, so you, th you think how I had nothing responsible to do. you were for that project and why you were claiming credit for that. I think the best will in the world, you're just to suggest that somebody who was transport minister, as I was, for a year overseeing a major infrastructure project, to think I didn't have any role in it. My I role, of course, is to make sure had a role in I brought it in under budget. But to criticise the SNP government for delivering that phenomenal Queen's Ferry Crossing... I have crossing, not. I have not criticised I think it's not going to win us support for independence. It's giving ammunition I've said, to I've, our I've opposition. I've started my remarks quite literally by saying that it was a very successful infrastructure project. Let's You're not obviously give, not listening let's to what not I'm saying. Our, so, I'll move on to the NHS. The public are obviously very concerned about some of the issues that we've got in our NHS. And obviously, you are currently in charge of the NHS. So did you take responsibility for that loss of trust that the public have in that major um, and beloved institution of our NHS? Look, at, as leader of the SNP, if I'm elected, and as First Minister, I'll always take responsibility because ultimately, of course, as Cabinet Secretaries, uh, as First Minister, we have to make sure we take responsibility. So but let, think... me, let, me, let me also say that I take responsibility for the fastest ever COVID rollout, booster rollout. I take responsibility for the fact that not a single day in the NHS has been lost to strike action. I take responsibility for the fact we've reduced waiting times for inpatients and outpatients in the longest waits by 25%. I take responsibility for the fact that 12 and 8-hour waits in A&E have reduced by 40 to 50% since the winter peak. But the public are, are saying, due to the, re the recent polling, that I think, what was the figure, 62%? saying that you're not, you're not managing it very well. So do you, t do you take responsibility on, for Ash, that? We are living at a time where the NHS has faced its biggest shock for 17 years. No, I understand that. Years. I think that, is, that is definitely a factor. But what I'm saying the United is... Kingdom. So, yes, the NHS is my responsibility, absolutely. Where it has done well is my responsibility. Mm -hmm. Where there's still okay, can is I'll, my I'll just, responsibility. I'll finish off with one last question. Of course. Which is, you've obviously made much of your progressive credentials during this campaign, and we spent quite a lot of time talking about those type of issues. Um, so I'm wondering if you can give some clarity to the viewers and the SNP members about that missed vote, because there's a couple of different conflicting ideas about what, what may have happened there to do with the vote on equal marriage. Yeah, I think it's Alex Salmon, the leader of the ALBA party, who the a rival party to the SNP, who's tried to cast doubt on that, of course. No, I think and, there is also people that are in the well, SNP let's as well. Say the, the leader of ALBA, who No, who's people that are in the SNP. That. And I'm not sure why you would bring that up when I've already answered the question, of course, that I was helping to make sure a Scottish Pakistani who was in a Pakistani jail on death row for blasphemy, I was making sure I could get him released. Of course, his family have said that my intervention was crucial to that. So to drag that up nine years later in a leadership contest, 
I don't think reflects very well on you. I can understand why the leader of the ALBA party would do it. It's, I'm not sure why a fellow person... There's nothing the to SNP. do with that. This was um, raised by someone who's in, currently in the SNP. It's the lead, well, I've, I've given you the explanation. If you want to do ALBA's work for them in that regard, they're a rival party to the SNP, I don't think that's going to win us support. I've just said that this is someone just from to, the SNP. Just to, be, just to jump in there, I actually did that interview with Alex Salmond and he said that his recollection was that you were asked to avoid that final vote and he was told that that was for religious reasons or religious pressure. Just to put it on record, that's what he told me on record in an interview. I yes, know you're, that you have said that that is not... That yes. is not correct, but just to clear that yes, up... Yes, you're right, it, it was point. Alex Salmond, the leader of a rival party. I, the at the party. time, he was first... Me. I, let's, we leave it, but just to put it on the record, that's what he said on the record. You, on the record, have said that is not true. Sure. Let's move on. There's Now we're going to do some quick fire questions, one of my favourites. I need snappy answers, please. I'm going to kick off uh, with a viewer question, and this one is from Terry Moore. And the question is... If you win, will you ask advice from Nicola Sturgeon? Ash, I'll start with you. Of course I would. Nicola is a very successful politician. She has been at the top of her game for many, many years now. It's very unusual in politics to be um, in that, at that high level for such a long period, so of course I would. However, I think she's uh, looking for other jobs elsewhere, so she may not be around for much longer. Uh, snappy answer, absolutely yes. She's exceptional. Uh, yes, but I have to say it will be the strangest feeling in the world answering a question from Nicola Sturgeon in the back benches, but yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. What about Alex Salmon? Take advice from him? No. No? Okay. He's in a different party, a rival party, so, so no. So no? No. No. So no one takes advice from Alex Salmon, but all yes to Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, let's start off with you, Hamza, for this one. Is J.K. Rowling a national treasure? Oh, yes, I think she's done amazing in terms of the book she's written, but I disagree with her vehemently on the issue of transgender rights. OK. Yes, and I do think she's brave. Do you disagree with her on the issue of transgender rights? No, I don't disagree with her. You don't disagree with no. her, so you, so you back her on that. Ash? Um, I think she's a national tre treasure, yes. I think she was very brave to speak out on an issue where many women who had raised legitimate concerns were receiving, you know, quite threatening communications. So, yes, she's uh, definitely a national treasure. OK, and Kate, I'll come to you first for this one. Gary Lineker has been reinstated as a BBC presenter. After the chaos of the last few days, should the Director General Tim Davey stand down? Well, I certainly think he's not done the BBC any services at a time when already there is huge debate. Freedom of speech is a huge question mark in our society. And I think the whole process has been managed really badly. Ash? I would agree with that. I think it has been managed badly and it has not made the BBC look in a very good light. Tim Davies, stay on go. I think he should... Well, it's up to him. He, he maybe will want to consider that, but it definitely has put the BBC in a... It looks like it's in a bit of a conflicted position. Do you regret giving Gary Lineker a red card the other night? I now? did preface it by saying that I hadn't actually seen the tweets concerned and I thought it was something to do with football. <laughs> OK. Hamza, what do you think? Tim Davies... Uh, look, I, I, I genuinely don't think government ministers acting and, and, and current serving government ministers should be interfering in who's in charge of our public broadcaster or not. Gary Lineker was absolutely right to make the remarks he did. And it's a heck of a world where the main opposition is Gary Lineker and Carol Vorderman at the moment, but more power to both their elbows. OK, final quick fire. I'm going to go to you first, Ash. Rishi Sunak or Keir Starmer, who's the next PM? Um, I think that it was looking at the moment that it might be Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer, Kate. I think it's highly likely it'll be Keir Starmer. Well, one's a Tory and one's a pale imitation of a Tory, but I'll tell you what, I'll work with anybody to kick out the Tories. Well, let, let, let me come on to this. Do you think it's going to be Keir Starmer, though? I suspect it would be. OK, let, let's come on to this. This is, like, the, the final question now, because if there's an expectation that Labour will win the next general election, it might be that they win that by being the largest party, but they don't win an outright majority. You, the SNP, are the third biggest party in Westminster. You are, if you like, the kingmakers. So it's a very simple question. I'm going to start with you, Hamza. What would be your price of supporting or propping up a Labour minority government? What's yeah, the price? Give us the power to hold a referendum because our democracy and our voice should not be denied any longer. So you want... The, the, section 30 power to hold You want the, the Section 30... He, you want... If, if, if I had a shopping list, the next one would be repeal of Section 35, of course, which is used to veto legislation passed so, by a majority of the... So your prices give us that referendum that Absolutely. we want, Kate? Well, we will always side with fellow progressive parties. You know, I care immensely about independence, and I'll come on to my price. 
But measures right now to eradicate poverty are measures that I would wholeheartedly support. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to any price of that, I think we should be united in eradicating poverty. But secondly, for anything more, it would need to be another referendum. That, that, that's interesting, though. So what you're suggesting is that you would vote with uh, Labour on a case-by-case -case basis in Westminster, depending on the policies, regardless of whether they gave you a referendum or not. It's, it's an interesting well, position. Well, I, I, just, would never, that's what you're saying. I would never trade poverty and independence. I right. firmly believe in working with anybody who will work with us to eradicate the fact that one in four children in Scotland are in poverty. But ultimately, any support needs to be contingent on uh, another referendum. OK. Ash Regan? Yes, I think, obviously, if you were going to do a deal of that kind, you would need to extract something for the, the country of Scotland. At the moment, we're obviously in a political stalemate where... Westminster are denying the voice of Scotland being expressed. So a Section 30 order would be an obvious way to go there. So in terms of, in terms of Labour, though, presumably all of you are quite worried at the moment because it could be that having had this dominance uh, in Scottish politics for so long that Labour could be enjoying a renaissance now that Nicola Sturgeon... Obviously, you're frowning at me. Well, now that Nicola Sturgeon is standing your, down. It's because your own poll out today showed that we've increased support from the last poll and it shows that Labour has fallen behind. So anybody... Well, Labour, opponents certainly, or Labour either... certainly see Nicola Sturgeon going as an opportunity, let me put it that yes, way. Yes, but your, your own poll shows that's not the case. And the reason why is because we've had that progressive agenda that's won us so much support. But I want to build on that, make sure we don't lose. So we won't be complacent. What I'll do is I'll build the team, harness all the talent of the SNP, and make sure we deal with the issues affecting people, the cost of living crisis, not reducing poverty, eradicating it. That's what I want to make sure we do, and I don't think... We need to be worried, uh, okay. overly worried about Labour. OK, we've only got a little bit of time. So, quick quest so, quick so, answers, please. So no party should take its support for granted. The way that we've won successive elections is maintaining the trust that we will stand up for the Scottish people. And that's why I think in this contest, it is about a reset. It's about who can reach out to new voters, even no voters, and maintain that winning victory when it comes to our elections. Quick last word for us, Are you concerned that if another candidate wins that perhaps isn't as focused on independence as you, that, that, that you could lose out? I've I think, literally 10 seconds, please. I think we need not to take our current support for granted. I think we need fresh leadership that can give people hope and inspire them to come out and vote SNP. OK, well... Thank you so much. We are out of time. Can you believe it? it went so quickly. Thank you so much, Kate Forbes, Hamza Yousaf, Ash Reagan, for joining us. One of them is going to be crowned the new SNP leader. Watch it all on Sky News.